In this video, we're going to look at a 4-inch Sony flat CRT monitor. Now, the CRT itself is less than an inch thick, and it projects on the back side of the glass, and you actually look through the front of it. This was part of a uh, monitor that Sony had called the Watch Cam Security System. So this is a Sony Watch Cam monitor, and it features a flat CRT. Now, this is before LCD TVs were made is actually a CRT, a picture tube. But as you notice, it's completely flat. And that's because the electron gun and all the deflection is down here and the, the beam is actually projected onto the back surface of the tube and you're actually looking through a clear piece of glass on the front. These units here were sold and they were, they were marketed primarily to uh, security people they, they sold a version that had a tuner in it, a, a portable TV. They called it a, a Watchman. But this one's called the Watch Cam because this one was sold along with a companion camera. And uh, you could mount it at your door, for example. As you can see, this thing works. I've just plugged it into my Blu-ray player. And we can uh, take a look at the picture on this thing. It actually didn't have a bad picture. It's black and white, of course, but these were perfect for somebody out in the field so that they could um, set up a camera. And you can see that the, the screen, the back of the screen is actually curved. And I've had this thing for a long time. This is, uh, if we look back at this unit to see how old this thing is. This one here was made in 1985. And what's significant about this is if we look at the serial number, this is number 240 off the production line. With Sony, the way that their serial numbers worked, the first two digits indicated the factory and the country. I believe with nine was Japan, and three was the factory Fukushima. But the Sony, their first two digits of their serial number indicated where it was made and what factory number. Now Dave over at the EEV blog, he took one of these units apart, a smaller one. He took apart, I think the one he had was maybe a two inch. This is a four inch screen. This was the larger of the two. And this one actually, as I say, came with a camera. I have the camera that actually plugs into this thing. It plugs in using this four pin multi-connector, but it also uses a standard AV plug. And if you, there was a special cord that would give you audio and video, but if you just plugged a regular uh, cord into here, like a regular RCA plug, it would just accept video. So there's nothing special you can plug video in, but if you have the special cord, which has got a, a second, it's got a, a ring, it's got a tip and a ring, you can get sound through that one connector. But if you just plug in the standard cord, then, uh, well, if I turn on the sound, you'll hear that it's gonna buzz. But anyway, I figured let's uh, take this thing apart and uh, see what makes this thing tick. I know that uh, Dave already did this over on his channel and I'm gonna do it a little bit different because he didn't uh, actually power the thing up while well, it was apart. I think we'd like to power this unit up. Maybe take a look at the uh, unit on the scope and take a look at what some of the ICs and stuff on here do. So let's get this thing apart and I'll, I'll power it up when it's disassembled. I actually still currently use this little monitor here in the shop. I have a camera, a black and white infrared camera that's up in my attic and it's just, it's just pointed at a mouse trap and I check it every day to see whether any mice have gotten up into the attic and that way I know if I have to uh, go and uh, reset the mouse trap. It's just a way of, it's an easy way of doing it. I just use this old monitor because, hey, you know, it's uh, it's good for that purpose. Okay, here we go. This is the inside of this unit. Here's this flat CRT. And I'm gonna tear this down a little bit more. So I'm just going to uh, take out the audio board here and disconnect the speakers from the, uh, disconnect the speaker wire from the board here. It even has an earphone socket. Like a headphone, like as if you're going to plug headphones in and listen to whoever's, I, I guess, I guess if this was being used for surveillance 
and the camera was hidden, somebody that was watching it could actually listen in with headphones instead of having the speaker on. Now there has been a little mod done to this unit here. That's what this green wire here that's just kind of wrapped around here, that's what that's for. What was done on this, the camera that came with this actually ran on 5 volts through the 4-pin multi and when the camera packed it in, I chopped the end of the 4-pin multi off and I rewired it to put a little CCD camera that required 6 volts. So what I did here is I just cut the, the power supply wire that you can see right down here, right here, and just extended the wire all the way back to the switch so that when it was turned on, there'd be 6 volts applied to the 4-pin multi-connector instead of the, I think it was 5 volts that the, old, the other camera used because it wasn't quite enough to make the conventional camera that I put on at work. Okay, so there's the, the back cover off of it. You notice it has little uh, knobs to adjust the brightness and the contrast and all they are is just little they, 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 these are the adjustments down here they're just trimmers and these little these little knobs plug into the base that turn the little trimmers for the brightness and the contrast I'm just trying to readjust this camera a bit so I don't get as many uh, uh, reflections so here's the here's the picture tube itself I haven't taken it out of this bracket this is more to protect it, I think, than anything. It just holds the circuit boards and stuff in place, but we don't really need to remove the, the tube from the bracket to see the operation. Now, at this end here, we've got the electron gun, and here's our little high-voltage generator. Now, these tubes do have a second anode on them, and it's actually connected right here. This is where that little cap goes for the high voltage. I believe the smaller tube had actually fed it in through the socket, if I'm not mistaken, but they do still have a second anode on this thing. And the second anode is, is actually in behind the uh, it's actually in behind the, the, the screen itself. If we look at the screen, you'll see that the screen is curved. You can see the, the curvature of the screen in behind here. So what happens on a tube like this, it's driven like a regular picture tube, as if this were a uh, if you were to take the the glass faceplate and put it into a conventional tube. That they, you know the tube would be the same length but your face plate would be up here and the, the electron beams would scan top to bottom left to right and it does the same thing on here but the way that the, the tube is deflected just with the design of the the uh, yoke the, the beam actually is deflected starting here and working its way down so it's it's still being deflected as it would a conventional beam it's just instead of the beam scanning up this way the beam is scanning down and this is all done by just the bias that they put onto the the uh, vertical deflection the horizontal deflection is very much like a conventional tube the beam is just scanning back and forth right left to right but instead of it going up and down this way it is starting in the middle portion and scanning down and because of the curvature of the screen you scan your raster on the back here of the tube we're going to have our filament uh, lead and there'll be a cathode and there will be a screen control and there will be focus. This white lead here is obviously going to be the focus. We can tell that because it's a high voltage lead or higher voltage lead. The orange one here is probably the screen and then your yellow brown is more likely the filament and the purple is going to be the video I believe. We'll figure that out in a minute. It's easy to find that out because I can scope this thing. And nope, wait a minute, the purple looks like the purple here is going to some diode, so this that's probably the screen. Orange is the screen. What's the purple? Where's the purple go? Purple comes down here, right next to I bet you that's video. I bet you that one there is video. We can find out. I can put the scope on here and we can actually take a look at some video signals if my scope will allow me to because I got this stupid cheap DSO right that doesn't really like to uh, doesn't really like to display video very well but let's hook it up let's put power to this thing let's energize this thing and make it dangerous because we like dangerous so when I turn this on we should have a picture okay now we should have a picture 
Yes, we do. It's just there's nothing showing on the screen. There we go. The DVD is just restarting. Oh, look at this. We can swipe down. Um, that is that static electricity, okay, in my body. When I touch the screen here and I move my hand down, you can actually see I'm, I'm able to I'm able to, to, to deflect the beam slightly. If I were to play with something magnetic, like a screwdriver, as you can see, I, I can really raise havoc. And that screwdriver is not that not magnetized that much. If I were to uh, bring in a screwdriver in that was a little bit more magnetized, like this one, as you can see, we can really affect the picture. And this is how they this is how they got these these uh, flat screens to work. They applied a, a bias magnetic charge onto the yoke coil, so they gave it a predominantly negative bias or a predominantly positive bias to actually force the beam down. And just through the curvature of the screen, it scans it. So your, your vertical is actually not as much of a deflection on this, it's the linearity. Anyway, if we play around with the controls on this thing, we've got our standard controls and they're all marked on the side here. We've got our horizontal frequency, vertical hold, vertical linearity, vertical size, key zone correction and horizontal size. So if we play around with this thing, you will see that I can change the horizontal hold, vertical hold, this one is vertical linearity, we have vertical size, and we have keystone adjustment and horizontal size. So what keystone adjustment does is it will change the for, compensate for distortion which you will get a lot of distortion on a picture tube like this that's flat because uh, just getting the beam to scan oh and when you do this don't use magnetic screwdrivers getting the beam to scan correctly I should probably adjust it using one of these little adjusters that uh, is used for the brightness and so forth these will fit right in here And of course, this one's horizontal size. And as you can see, when I bring the size in, the picture's not actually, the size isn't really changing. It's actually affecting the keystone of it as well. I'll try to adjust that to make it kind of, kind of look normal. On this side, we've got 5 volt adjust and the 16, 15 volt? 16 volt adjust. So even though the unit is only operating at 6 volts, there's a 16 volt uh, DC to DC converter in here as well. So there's a 16 volt adjustment. I'm trying to get that picture as straight as I possibly can here. Hopefully this isn't going to trigger any type of a um, copyright strike. After all, it's a black and white picture. Almost perfect. There we go. Now we've got full 
Now I've got full screen deflection again. I've also got other adjustments down here. We've got, uh, what is this one? We've got a sub brightness control. And we've got a screen control. And uh, I think there's also a four volt adjustment screen control. I don't know if there's a focus control on this or not. Brightness and contrast. Here's our screen control. So if I play with the screen control, you'll see that this will affect the whole entire brightness of the screen. And this one's a sub brightness control over here, which also does the same. If we turn the brightness up too high, it's going to bloom on this set. So, but overall, they actually have a, a, a actually quite a good picture. Fairly good contrast. It's hard, it's hard to see it here because the lighting in here is just so incredibly bright in the studio here. There's also a focus control down on the side here, which we can adjust, and that'll adjust the focus of the actual CRT. So if I turn the focus control, you'll see maybe if I turn some of the lights out in here, it might show up a bit better, but we can certainly focus the, the tube. I kill some lights. Let's just say I got an awful lot of lights running in here. Okay, now that I've killed some of the lights, so I can see this a little better. Let's adjust the focus. Now that actually has a very sharp picture. I don't know how well it's coming over on camera, but you know, if I if I shade it here from the light that's overhead. This thing's actually got a very, a very sharp picture. It's a little black and white TV and you could actually watch TV on this and they actually sold a version that had a tuner in it that you could actually sit and watch, take it to the ball game or so forth with you, right? It's got a great picture. Anyway, you guys want to see what this thing looks like on the scope, I'm sure, so I'm going to fire the lights up here so that we can actually take a look at some of the signals. Okay, here's our deflection yoke. This is the horizontal sweep from the deflection yoke, and if it, that looks a bit odd, it's because if I slow down my sweep, you will see that the horizontal has actually got a sawtooth signal riding on there as well. This is what made these tubes incredibly hard to drive compared to a conventional tube because you see as the beam scans down the tube the distance actually becomes closer to the electron gun therefore they actually have to modulate the horizontal deflection coil with the vertical signal superimposed over top of it so what we have here is we have the horizontal pulses if I go back and look at my scan Here's our horizontal pulses, but you can see here it's riding up and down in amplitude or ramping up and down in amplitude because we've also got the vertical sawtooth superimposed on top of the horizontal uh, signal. And that is required because as the beam starts to scan down, it becomes closer to the actual electron gun. And the, the signal would be much smaller, right? Because the distance is based, or the size of the scan is based on the uh, uh, width, or the width is based on the distance for focus. But because this this at the closer to the the, the bottom of the screen is considerably closer to the electron gun. So first of all, it's going to change the focus. So the focus is also going to be modulated. I can't look at the focus output because the voltage is going to be too high for my scope. But if I was able to look at the focus output, you would find that the focus voltage is also modulated with the vertical uh, scan frequency. So it'll have a sawtooth superimposed on that to change the actual focus voltage to keep that spot in focus as it becomes closer to the actual uh, electron gun. But it, it ramps up the amplitude. If we look back at the scope, well, you can see it here. As the scan goes across, or as, as the beam scans from top to bottom, it actually ramps up the amplitude of the horizontal to kick that beam out so that you get the full coverage of the screen. 
So in this respect, it was a little more complex to drive one of these flat CRTs than it was a conventional square CRT because of just the geometry involved in doing so. By comparison, if we look at the vertical, we'll see that the vertical is also distorted. It's not a nice straight sawtooth. And again, for the same reason, the vertical uh, sawtooth has to also be modified because as the beam is scanning from top to bottom, uh, and you'll also notice, look at the offset. Okay, this is our zero cross here. You'll see that it's, it's much higher on one side than the other. Um, the, the reason for that is that's what's biasing, first of all, the beam so that it scans down as opposed to trying to scan up, which would then deflect the beam out through the glass and you wouldn't have a picture. It would just go off the screen. But um, you can see how the, the waveform here it's not a nice straight sawtooth like a regular ver a regular TV would have a straight like a like a triangle waveform a sawtooth, and this here is more of a a, a nonlinear sweep, and that again is to compensate for the curvature and the way that the tube is designed, um, just to try and it's it's that that's part of that pin cushion and keystone adjustment is to uh, compensate for the actual shape of the tube. So as you can see. It wasn't just a matter of making the tube flat, but they actually had to come up with some interesting drive signals to drive that tube so that you got a, a normal looking picture. If we look at the yellow lead going up to the CRT, this is the actual video signal coming off the board. And, uh, well, again, this scope doesn't do, for, doesn't do video very well. It's not a, it's not a real high-end scope. I'd do much better if I had a, an analog scope here. But it gives me a representation of what this DSO thinks video should look like. If I freeze it, okay, there's a freeze of video. You can actually see the this is the vertical interval test signal that was at the top of the screen there. This is the, because this is a 16 by 9 picture, there's the black, and here's the video signal here in black, and then here's your here's the sync. If I go to a horizontal, sweep rate well it's not looking pretty as I say this is a uh, this is a cheap scope that uh, I've got here it's not the best for looking at video in fact it's actually kind of useless for looking at video I'm still I'm still looking to get my hands on another uh, another analog scope or perhaps even get around to attempting to repair the high voltage bar multiplier because that might be a project just to to take out the potting of the uh, high voltage multiplier, multiplier and uh, just get a bunch of uh, high voltage diodes and a bunch of capacitors and uh, make myself a new one. That might be the option on that because I, I haven't had much luck. I've been looking for uh, a half decent used scope and I've had many people offer to send me a scope but you know I've had probably 10 people that have come on on the channel and said hey I've got a scope I will send you one. And even when I say, hey, find out what it's going to cost to ship it, I'll, I'll pay the shipping. And uh, it's nothing has materialized. So I'm kind, of, I'm kind of losing hope that someone's going to donate a scope and I'm going to have to find one. But as, as of yet, I haven't found one that uh, has been acceptable where um, the, the people that are selling them, you know, they want to get top dollar for it. And, uh, you know, it's uh, especially when they find out, oh, you're the guy from the Internet. And they see dollar signs in their eyes like I've made a money. It's like, it's like they think I make a fortune off these YouTube videos. If only they knew how, how little we make off of these videos. Anyway, um, that's the basic operation of this little device here. I thought you guys might think this is kind of cool. And if you want to see a breakdown of, of uh, a whiteboard of this, go over to... Uh, go over to Dave Jones's channel on EEV blog. I think he does a great job of explaining the actual deconstruction of the tube. He's got a drawing of it and he compares this one to, uh, uh, I think it was a Sinclair, which used electrostatic deflection, which was simpler than what uh, Sony used on this. It didn't have all this correction circuitry that Sony had to have, but uh, I think uh, there's no question that uh, this approach certainly did give better performance than the others. Here we got a ground up here right on the back of the tube here 
So this is just like a regular conventional tube. This thing's got all the ground. Here's all our here's all our transistors. Take a look at the of the uh, component mounting on this. It's all surface mount on this back side of the board here. So unlike the sample that uh, Dave showed off on the uh, on his channel, which had surface mounted ICs, as you can see, this one here doesn't doesn't have any ICs. This one's all discrete transistors. They're surface mounted transistors. It's, it's a single sided board too. Uh, it's just through hole and some surface mounted transistors. If we look on the top side of the board, you can see there's there's a couple of ICs. There's one IC. I think that's probably an audio amplifier IC for the audio circuit. But everything else, oh, there's one IC over here. This is probably going to be down here. That's I, I would guess that that is, uh, what is it? It's a Hitachi chip. Let's take a look at the number of this one. It's a um, HA11441. I believe that's a signal, that's a sync processor for TV. Is that, and uh, on this side, there's another little IC over here. This one here is a, who made this one? Is it a Sony? This looks like a Sony chip. It's a CX220, CX22011. Yeah, CX22011. That looks to be a Sony chip, that one. IC201. That's going to be in the power supply because this is where the, this is where the regulators are down here. And there's a little inductor over here, too. This is, where they're, this is where they're generating the 16 volt. As you can see on here, there's an adjustment. I don't know if I can get it much closer without the camera. Oh, maybe I can a little bit closer. So you have a 16 volt adjustment. You're only getting six volts in. So there's a little bit of a boost circuit in here. Looks like this is an inductor that they're using to uh, boost the voltage up. So they're using a, a buck boost or boost converter, buck boost. Um, earphone plug here couple of small caps down in here so say there's not a heck of a lot to this thing I would imagine that the horizontal uh, output transistor is probably one of these ones over here I'm thinking we can find out pretty easy I can just put the scope on it and see which one's got a drive signal let's uh, let's do that let's put it let's put the uh, power back to this thing and we'll just take another look and see what uh, these transistors do Give it a video signal again. I'm just grounding to the, the headphone terminal. It's going to be ground. Okay, let's just take a look at what we have here on the collector. I see nothing on that one. Hmm. Okay, that one's vertical. If we look at the scope. Okay, this is going to be vertical output. What is this one here? That's vertical. So these are the vertical outputs, these ones here. Right? That's your vertical output. Transistors, both of them. The horizontal output is probably on the bottom of the set here. I'm sure there's another... There could be another transistor down here somewhere. On the bottom. And... It's probably this one right over here. I'm going to guess that it's going to be one of these ones. There's a big one here. Is it that one? Yeah, there's the horizontal output. Okay, if we uh, bring the scale down a bit and take up the, the gain, that is... There's the horizontal output. And again, it's modulated. So 
So isn't that interesting? The horizontal output transistor is actually modulated with that sawtooth signal. So it's not just something that they've added at the yoke. They're actually modulating the output. So, and that, that would explain, you know, that makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. They are modulating the horizontal output with the vertical signal because think about it. That will modulate the output to the flyback transformer, which will modulate the focus, and it will modulate the screen voltage, and it will also modulate the high voltage. Well, the high voltage doesn't really matter, right? That's insignificant because the, the, the second anode in the tube is going to store that anyway. But by modulating, by modulating the horizontal output uh, waveform, you're going to cause an immediate effect on the focus voltage and the screen voltage, which are picked up off of the flyback and I can't measure them but they're they're in here you can see the high voltage circuits in here I can't measure them with this thing because they're going to be over the rating of the scope so I don't want to burn out my scope but because um, they'll be in the kilovolt range right so the second anode on this I don't know what it is but I, I'm going to say it's, it's probably five to six thousand volts for the second anode on something of this size so the the screen the focus voltage is probably in the two kilovolt one and a half to two kilovolt range and the screen is going to be several hundred volts so I'm not going to stick the probe and I'm not going to stick my fingers in there for sure when it's running because I don't want to get a shock if you know what I mean it's not fun I've had too many of them over the years anyway uh, that's the look at this thing let's put this thing back together I don't want to oh, get some dirt on that. I don't want to damage this thing because it's kind of a collector's item right having one of these things is kind of like having an indexatron and I have an indexatron. You guys have seen it before. That 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 video magic uh, projector. It's an indexatron. Um, Sony also made a little color TV with an indexatron tube. I don't have one. I'm I'm looking for one because I think they're just so cool. A color set that uses just a single gun. Um, very cool. And they made a couple small ones like this, like small four inch screens. I got my eyes open for one. I haven't found one. There's probably not too many of them around. I got another piece to show you guys on a future video, which you guys probably have never seen. Okay, this will be coming up. I've shown this off before, but I've not taken it apart. We'll do a teardown on this on a future video. This is the first liquid crystal television set that Panasonic made that actually used a, a TFT LCD screen. This one, the backlight is just about shot on this one, but it was kind of cool because you see, you could open this up. If you were watching it, outside in the sun you could open this thing up and it had a silver reflector that would reflect the light through the back of the screen but when you closed it, it turned on the backlight and um, we'll, we'll see if we can get this one at some point uh, we'll see if we can get this thing to actually display a picture I know the backlight's got a problem uh, the, the fluorescent little backlight in there is uh, just about toast but, and it doesn't have that many hours on it, but they, they weren't good for very long. This is kind of neat. This has got an FM radio with FM stereo, if you plug in headphones, and it's a little color TV, VHF, UHF, and uh, would run off batteries. And these things were real expensive. Like this this little unit here, when this hit the market, this was, I forget how many how much it was, $1,200, I think, $1,200 to $1,400. Um, I'll tell the story how I got this thing on a future video but basically I'll tell you the story now there was a a woman that runs um, an underwater cinematography company she's a cinematographer worked on some big high budget movies like our police academy or whatever I think it was police academy and she did does underwater photography and she wanted a small color monitor to plug into the video output from the film camera that they they scuba dive with in film and uh, came into the shop that I work for and ordered this thing in and it arrived and it was red now to a, most people they wouldn't give a damn it's gonna be put in a waterproof housing what do you care that the thing is red but no red was not good she wanted it in black and she actually returned the thing after buying it and using it she actually returned the thing to the shop and demanded that they uh, get one in black so this thing was sitting around the store just collecting dust and nobody wanted it and finally my boss just said one day to me he says you know you want that TV here you can have it 
he was tired of looking at it. It had it had a birthday in at the shop, and uh, I guess they had paid for it, and then they bought another one. They brought the thing back, and finally uh, he was sitting on the thing, and I he gave it to me for next to nothing. Anyway, I used it as a camera monitor for a while, and uh, then it packed it in, and I retired it. Anyway, we'll take that one apart on a future video. This one was about this. I find this is quite an interesting. These uh, these flat displays are, are quite unique because of the way that they were designed. And as I say, you can you can actually see through. You guys can't see it, but if I hold this up to the light, you can actually see through the tube here, through the bottom portion. That's that black portion down there is transparent. If I hold this up to the light, you'll see it. See what I mean? You can actually see through that portion of the tube. Here's something interesting from the back cover too. See, it's got the date here, October 85, which is the same date that's on this one here. And it, it tells me where this was made. It's not Tokyo. This was actually Fukushima. Right here. And on the sticker inside here. Right? For the, uh, the sticker here. So, I love it. All these Sonys, everything has its own part number. Sticker has a part. This, this sticker's got a part number. This sticker's got a part number. You know, they got all these part numbers for every little thing. Every little part has a part number, including all the stickers. And it just got the warnings, you know, the standard warnings. The picture tube is critical to safety against X radiation emission. You think? Uh, I don't think it says replace with a tube of the same type number for continued safety. Like as if you're gonna get a substitute picture tube for one of these things. Come on, the only people that ever made a flat uh, a flat tube was Sony. Nobody else made them. Where else are you going to get a tube from? Nowhere, because Sony made. Sony were the only company that made these things. Let's get these uh, controls back in here. Just slide this back in place, and then we'll put the brightness and contrast controls back in. I think they can be set after the back is snapped on, if I'm not mistaken. So we'll snap the back back on. Uh, what do I got to do here? There's a clip that's got to go in here. Put it to the board like that. Okay. Now I should be able to put these contrast and brightness controls should be able to snap in here. This must have been an afterthought. There's one. There's the other. Okay, now I gotta make sure that I get all the fingerprints and stuff off this thing. And I'll put this thing back into service and I'll show you guys. I won't bother connecting the speaker. I don't need the speaker connected. I'll plug this thing into my camera and show you guys my rat cam. But this just goes to show the quality. This thing is uh, 32 years old and it still works. You see? There's my rat cam, and there's a big rat right there. So I just leave this, this is in my attic, basically right above my head in the workshop here. I caught a rat a few years ago. There hasn't been one back since, but I don't want to have to check for it. So I just uh, used my little, my little watch cam, and I turn it on every day. Every day I turn this thing on and look to see that, that trap is still set you can see it it's not been tripped I get the camera to focus on here you can see that uh, the old Victor trap there has not been triggered and there's the big rat that guards it and I got oh that's just some dirt on the outside here not on the tube anyway that's uh, that's what I use this monitor for 
I've been using it for this for, for many, many years. And uh, I used to use this. I had this as a security camera. I had, the, I had the camera at my front door back in the day when black and white was, uh, black and white ruled the security um, industry. Well, it's long since been replaced with color cameras. The black and white camera that came with this packed it in. I've got a black and white camera up in the uh, attic and I just use this, when I turn this on, it powers up the camera and uh, I check it every day. It warms up pretty quick and uh, that way I can tell whether I've had any visitors. And touch wood, I haven't had any visitors in a while, but I think it might be this big one here. This big, this big fake rubber rat that'll be going us next week's Halloween, so that'll be out in my front yard to scare the kids. But uh, anyway, <laughs> that's where I, I store all the the uh, decorations and stuff up in the attic space, directly above my head, basically. And that's where that camera is. And as I say, it uh, this monitor's 32 years old. Gets turned on for a couple of minutes every day, and. Uh, does the job. Thanks for watching.